Hey guys, it's your favorite medical channel, Medicosis Perfectionals, aka the Rolls Royce of medical education. We continue our bleeding and coagulation playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about the three different groups of coagulation factors. We have the fibrinogen group, the prothrombin group, and the contact group. Today, we'll talk about the coagulation test, the PT, the PTT, the TT, the DRVVT, serum fibrinogen level, and others. First, let me answer the question of the previous video. Which of the following results of the serum protein electrophoresis is expected in a patient with type 4 RTA? What's RTA? Renal tubular acidosis. Here is the normal serum protein electrophoresis, and these are your choices. So before we answer this, let's look at the choices. A is normal. How about B? B, we have increased alpha-1 globulin. All right because as you know, we have albumin, this is just one albumin, and then the globulins, the globulins are four subtypes, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and gum. How about C? C has low alpha-1 globulin. Choice D, we have increased alpha-2 globulin. How about choice E? There is decreased alpha-2 globulin. How about F? F is increased beta globulin, and then G is increased gamma globulin. Before we answer the question, increased gamma globulin, this can be seen in multiple myeloma, baby, or Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. In multiple myeloma, this is made of IgG. In Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, this is made of IgM. Cool. Which of the following results is expected in a patient with type 4 RTA? Okay, type 4 RTA. What the flip is type 4 RTA? To understand this, we need to review the different types of RTA. We have RTA type 1, RTA type 2, and guess what? RTA type 4. 3 doesn't exist. Okay, type 1, there is a defective distal convoluted tubule in the kidney. In type 2, there is defective proximal convoluted tubule in the kidney. In type 4, there is low renin, which will lead to low aldosterone in the kidney. So, 1, defective distal, not proximal. 1 is distal, 2 is proximal. I know it's weird. The whole thing is weird. Type 4, low renin, low aldosterone type of a renal tubular acidosis. Okay, what was the normal function of renin? May he rest in peace. Oh, renin used to convert angiotensinogen tensinogen, into angiotensin 1. Okay, and this was the function of renin. Renin used to work here. But now in type 4, there is low renin. So there is low conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Therefore, the level of angiotensinogen will increase in the serum. And as you know, angiotensinogen came from the liver. Oh, therefore, it's a protein. Oh, it's a plasma protein. Is it albumin or globulin? It's a globulin. Is it an alpha globulin, beta globulin, or gamma globulin? It's an alpha globulin. Is it alpha 1 globulin or alpha 2 globulin? It's an alpha 2 globulin. Which of the following choices represent an increased angiotensinogen, which is an alpha 2 globulin? Oh, look at this. Look at this. Increase alpha-2 globulin. This will make it choice D. Okay, so now we know that angiotensinogen is an alpha-2 globulin. What is alpha-1 globulin? Uh, this is actually the alpha-1 antitrypsin. Do you remember emphysema? Yeah. Emphysema will be C because it will have decreased alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is an alpha-1 globulin. Okay, so let's review. Liver proteins or plasma proteins are either albumin or globulin. Now the globulin is subdivided into alpha, beta, and gamma. And then we have alpha 1 and alpha 2. Cool. Alpha 1 globulin such as the alpha 1 antitrypsin. Alpha 2 globulin, this is today's topic, it was angiotensinogen. Okay, how about beta globulins? We have two. We have the famous coagulation factors that we are talking about in this glorious playlist on bleeding and coagulation disorders. Of course, except calcium, because calcium doesn't come from the liver. And we have the famous iron carrier in the plasma, Mr. Transferrin, the transporter of ferrin. Oh, fer is like ferrous or ferric or whatever. This is iron, and I-N means protein, and trans means transportation. GABA and globulins, these are your immunoglobulins, aka your antibodies. And of course, you have five of these. You have an IgE, IgG, IgM, IgD, and IgA. The acronym is MAGID. Now, where else would you find medicine organized like this? Wikipedia? Oh, give me a break. 
Hemostasis is formation of a clot to decrease blood loss. Vasoconstriction is step, step number one. Step number two is temporary plated plug. This is primary hemostasis. Step number three is coagulation. This is secondary hemostasis. And then you have fibrolysis and regeneration and repair. Here are the steps, vasoconstriction, primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrolysis. If we want to test for primary hemostasis, we use platelet count, bleeding time, and there is another test called platelet aggregometry. If we want to test for secondary hemostasis, we use PT, APTT, and TT. This is called prothrombin time, this is called activated partial thromboplastin time, and this is called thrombin time. We can also measure the serum fibrinogen level. Fibrinolysis, you test for it using fibrinogen degradation products, fibrin degradation products, and the famous fibrin D-dimer or fibrin split products. We have talked about these before. Today, we'll talk about PT, APTT, TT. English people love T. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a terrible joke. Dr. House doesn't. Enough with the stereotypes. The difference between primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis is gigantinormous. The hero, platelets, coagulation factors. End result, here the plated plug, here the fibrin thrombus test. Plated count, bleeding time, plated aggregometry. Here we have the PT, the PTT, and TT. Also we have the serum fibrinogen level, and of course fibrinogen is factor 1, as we have discussed before. Disease symptoms. If I have a primary hemostasis defect, I'll suffer from superficial or mucocutaneous bleeding. But if I have secondary hemostasis defect, I'll suffer deep tissue bleeding or anatomical bleeding. This is the splinter hemorrhage, hemarthrosis, muscle hematoma, brain hemorrhage, latery bleeding, and bleeding after tooth extraction. Horrible stuff. But there's Agis petechiae purpura o crimea river. I'm joking. If I have problems with platelets, it's either problem with platelet number, aka quantitative, or platelet function, aka qualitative. We test for platelet number using platelet count. We test for platelet function using bleeding time. And low platelet number is called thrombocytopenia. Decreased platelet function is called thrombasthenia. In the past, we have talked about the lab test to measure plated number, and there is manual counting, automated counting, optical counting, flow cytometry, etc. And the lab test to measure plated function. To measure the plated function, you need to start with the plated number, and then bleeding time, plated aggregometry, you can add ADP, epinephrine, collagen, restocetin, etc. Plated function is simply, oh, who cares? Hemostasis is either primary hemostasis or secondary hemostasis. How do we test for primary hemostasis? Plated number or plated function, and we have talked about this before. Today, we'll talk about how to test for secondary hemostasis. You have the clotting times, not time, but times, and the coagulation factor assays. Clotting times include PT, APTT, and TT. Coagulation factor assays, there is the clot-based assay, there is the chromogenic assay, there is the antigenic assay, and there is serum fibrinogen level. Now, the explanation that's coming up next is based on the foolish assumption that you have watched my previous video. Unless you are the Oprah Winfrey of hematology or the Michael Jordan of medicine, you are not going to understand what's coming up unless you have watched my previous videos. But if you are the Lionel Messi of pathology, you don't need to watch my previous videos. I should be learning from you. After all, you represent factor 10, which is the most important factor, at least in my world. So what's the goal? What is the ultimate purpose of the coagulation test? What is the why? As Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. He who has a why to the coagulation test can bear almost any mechanism. What is the goal of coagulation test? What are the indications? Okay, if a patient has an unexplained bleeding and we would like to know why, we do coagulation test. If the patient is ready for surgery, of course, we need to make sure that the patient is able to coagulate. Otherwise, you will get bleeding and the patient can die. This is called preoperative testing. If the patient is taking anticoagulant and we would like to monitor the patient's response to the anticoagulant, are we giving too much? Are we giving too little? Are we a bunch of pathetic pieces of melanin? So here's the coagulation cascade or secondary hemostasis. Start from here, baby. Fibrin is the goal. Stabilize the fibrin. This is factor 13. Where did fibrin come from? Fibrinogen. And then thrombin, converted fibrinogen into fibrin. Thrombin came from prothrombin. This is factor 1. This is factor 2. How do we activate prothrombin and thrombin? We need four things. We need two numbers and two words. 5 and 10, calcium and phospholipid. To activate 10, we can do it via extrinsic pathway. Thank you so much, factor 7. We can do it through intrinsic pathway. Thank you so much, 12, 11, 9, and 8. Thank you, Von Willebrand. If you understand the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic, you'll understand the difference between the PT test and the APTT test. Intrinsic, we need something intrinsic to the blood. We, we need something like from within the vessel. So, 
high molecular weight collagen, calicrin, subethyl collagen, or plate factor 3. Okay, here we need something from outside of the blood vessel, such as the tissue. We call it tissue factor or factor 3 or TPL. Intrinsic factor should take about 45 seconds, maybe a little longer. It has more steps. It's more efficient. This one has less steps. Therefore, it's less efficient, less steps, so it's shorter in time. It should take about 15 seconds. Intrinsic pathway involves four factors, which are 8, 9, 11, 12. Occurs in vivo and in vitro. Oh, okay. Why in vitro? Oh, because there is the negative charges of the wet surface of the glass of the test tube, and there is the high molecular weight collagen, calicrin, etc. However, extrinsic has only one factor, factor 7. You can argue it has two factors, like 7 and 3, because tissue factor is factor 3. And also, it occurs only in vivo. Why can't it occur in vitro? Oh, because we need something from the tissue called tissue factor, and there is no tissue in vitro. There is only tissue in your body. When we take blood from you, we just take blood, and then we make it into plasma. There is no tissue there. There is a lab test called PT test. It measures the extrinsic and the common pathway. Most students forget this. It also measures the common. How about the PTT measures the intrinsic and the common pathway? The mnemonic. PT has two letters. Okay, extrinsic pathway has two factors. Factor 3, which is the tissue factor, and factor 7. Mnemonic here, APTT has four letters. The intrinsic pathway has four factors, 8, 9, 11, 12. PT measures extrinsic and common. PTT measures intrinsic and common. Of course, since this is a shorter cascade, the normal value is less than 15 seconds. Since this is a longer cascade, normal value is less than 45 seconds. How do we perform the test in the lab? You get a test tube containing the lovely patient's plasma, and then you add surface activator and calcium. Cool. How do we add the anticoagulant? Citrate. Sodium citrate, baby. And if it has sodium citrate, it will be the blue top test tube. How about the PT? Same thing. You get the tissue extract because we need tissue factor. You add it to calcium and add citrate plasma, you get the blue top tube. PT measures extrinsic and common pathway, therefore prolonged in vitamin K deficiency, vitamin K antagonist, liver disease. These are basically the same thing. Factor deficiency, APS, which is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, heparin and DIC. This is prolonged in heparin because it affects the intrinsic pathway and the common. Hemophilia, yeah, factor 8, factor 9, factor 11, all of them are in the intrinsic pathway. Liver disease affects both pathways. Von Willebrand disease, yeah, it helped factor 8. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, warfarin and DIC. So warfarin can prolong both. Heparin can prolong both. Most students don't get this right. They'll say, oh, heparin just prolongs the APTT and warfarin just prolongs the PT. Nonsense. Heparin prolongs both, warfarin prolongs both. It's just that it's easier to monitor heparin using the APTT and to monitor warfarin using the PT. That's it. Thrombin time, TT. What's the goal to measure the final step? Fibrin to fibrin because this is the step that requires thrombin. Preparation. Get the dilute thrombin. Add it to the patient's plasma that has been saturated in a blue top test tube. Normal value should be less than 19 seconds. It's not an initial screening test. The initial screening tests are PT and PTT. TT will be prolonged in hypofibrinogenemia. Yeah, of course, there is no fibrinogen. Thrombin inhibitor. Yeah, there is no thrombin, so nothing is going to activate this. Heparin, because heparin activates antithrombin 3. Heparin is antithrombin. DIC, fibrinogen is consumed. Liver disease, fibrinogen is not produced. Warfarin. Warfarin is very similar to liver disease because it inhibits the vitamin K dependent gamma carboxylation of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. These are the colors of the test tube and the anticoagulant in each. Some pearls for the absolute pros. Heparin. Heparin will prolong the TT. However, the reptilase time is normal. Oh, reptilase. Are you into conspiracy theories? Haha. <laughs> reptilase time is similar to thrombin time. It measures the final step, which is fibrin to fibrin. However, it differs from the thrombin time is that the reptilase time is not affected by heparin. And that's why heparin, when we give heparin to a patient, it cannot prolong the reptilase time. Dilute Russell Viper Venom Test. We get the lovely patient's serum. Add dilute Russell Viper Venom to the patient's serum. The venom should activate factor 10 into 10A. We use this for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, aka lupus anticoagulant, because this lovely test can detect the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, which is prevalent in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In the hands of the wise, poison is medicine. In the hands of the fool, medicine is poison. In this case, poison is medicine. It's not actually medicine, it's a diagnostic test to diagnose antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, but that's close enough. 
and out of the most concentrated venoms there is medicine, said Ahmed Shawi, the famous late Egyptian poet. I don't believe you. Okay, Jeffrey, remember arsenic? Oh yeah, that's a poison. Yes, that's right. It can also treat some cancers, especially acute promyelocytic leukemia or APML. Remember, it's the T1517 translocation. It's associated with DIC, which will prolong your PT and PTT. You treat with vitamin A or ATRA. If it doesn't work, you can go with arsenic trioxide, baby. Because there are no solutions in life, there are only trade-offs. So we have talked about PT, PTT, TT, and we have the audacity to talk about the dilute Russell Viper Venom Test. Now, if your professor is an old dinosaur who hasn't opened a textbook in 57 years, he or she will tell you about something called the coagulation time. Uh, what the flip is that? The coagulation time was a very old archaic test before we discovered PT and PTT. It used to measure everything, the PT, the PTT, and the thrombin time. This, this, all of these were combined in one stupid test called coagulation time that couldn't tell you much. It, could, it, it just told you, oh, there was a problem in the coagulation cascade, go figure. But now we are more sophisticated, we can tell, oh, the problem is in the extrinsic pathway and the common, the problem is in the intrinsic pathway and the common, or the problem is in the final step. Coagulation factor assays and mixing study. Let's say that Raj had hemophilia A. This is classic hemophilia. The problem is in factor 8. So the next step is to order factor 8 activity. Of course, it will be decreased because he has hemophilia A. Uh, why did you say Raj and not Sarah? This is so mean. Because hemophilia A is an X-linked recessive disease that affects males in the overwhelming majority of cases. So you measure factor 8 activity. It's low. What's the next step? You order a mixing study. Why do you order a mixing study? Because the problem here with Raj's hemophilia could be that he has decreased factor 8. Or the problem could be that factor 8 level is fine. It's that Raj had an antibody, an inhibitor of factor 8, rendering factor 8 useless. That's why it, what decreased the activity. So you order a mixing study. What's that? You mix the patient's plasma, here is Raj's plasma, with normal plasma from Amitab. Just kidding, from any person. The normal plasma, by definition, has normal level of factor 8. When you add the plasma, which is normal, that has normal level of factor 8, to Raj's plasma, which has factor 8 problem, you have one of two consequences. First, factor 8 activity in Raj might improve. Yahoo! Proving that Raj had a deficiency of factor 8. Or, factor 8 activity will remain low. Ooh, why? Because Raj had an antibody, an inhibitor of factor 8. No matter how much factor 8 you're going to pour in, the inhibitor in Raj serum is gonna destroy your normal new factor 8. And that's how you combine coagulation factor assays, which measure, measure activity and level, with mixing study, which differentiate between actual deficiency and inhibition. Let's discuss serum fibrinogen level. This is easy, we're trying to measure plasma level of factor 1, which is fibrinogen, normal value is 200 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. I'll start to worry when it decreases below 50 or 100 milligrams per deciliter, which means there could be hypofibrinogenemia, there is low fibrinogen, there is decreased synthesis, probably, liver disease, there is decreased synthesis, DIC, there is increased consumption of fibrinogen. We did it, guys, absolutely incredible. In the upcoming videos, we'll take these factors one by one and talk about their pathologies. Test your knowledge on bleeding and coagulation disorders by getting my 50 hematology cases on my website. Also, you can get my antibiotics course from medicosisperfectionalist.com, the apotheosis of websites, which makes Amazon.com looks like meningitis. Speaking of antibiotics, just joking, Amazon. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. You can get my antibiotics course, my cardiac pharmacology course, my cancer pharmacology course, my 50 hematology cases at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe. Stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionist, where medicine makes perfect sense. It's the Rolls Royce of medical education.